Good morning, my friends, and thank you for joining me for this edition of Facebook Live. It's good to have you guys with me, and I've got my computer over here. Just got to mute it. Anyway, we are doing Bible quizzing today, so I hope that you're ready and um, hopefully excited for Bible quizzing. Many of you like it. Uh, some of you prefer the devotions, but every once in a while, I like to bring on Bible quizzing just to kind of test our knowledge of the Bible and all that good stuff. But uh, good morning, Jan. Good to see you. And Pam, thank you for joining me. Uh, yes, I'm home today. Today's Friday. Um, the weekend is upon us, and there's no football this weekend. Uh, no UFC worth mentioning. So that means family time and more family time than usual. So I'm looking forward to spending time with my sons and spending time with sweet Dina uh, this weekend, uh, maybe catching a nap, uh, focusing on my sermon. I'll be working on that some more tomorrow, even though the PowerPoint is finished. And um, <clears throat> um, let's see, mom and my brother are home in Michigan. It's 20 degrees there. Good morning, Lynn and Terry. Good to see you guys. Um, so they're probably not real pleased about that, but when you live in Michigan, you just put up with the winters, you get used to it. You've got good heaters and good windows. Um, but anyway, um, last night was a good night. I, I actually came home from work a little bit early. Thursday, I typically don't stay late. Uh, Dina goes off and does a Bible study with a couple of her friends, ladies from the church, and um, they've got like a little accountability group. Um, <clears throat> so it means Monty and I are home and we're chilling. So Monty and I were chilling last night and um, we were watching TV, just kind of relaxing together, which was good. And Monty enjoys his time with his dad and I really enjoy my time with him too. Good morning, Pat. Good to see you. Where is everybody? I've got 1104 and we've got just four people on here. I don't know if it's because you guys aren't into Bible trivia, which is what we're going to do today, but if you're not, that's okay. If you are, I've got some good questions for you. Let's wait for a few more people to get on. How are you guys doing? I hope you guys are doing well, ready for the weekend. I wonder if you have any plans for this weekend, anything fun going on. The weather's a little cold, but it's supposed to be really sunny. Good morning, Pam. Yeah, so it's going to be sunny, beautiful outside today. It's just a little on the cold side. I sent Monty off to school this morning with a jacket, and he was a little confused by that. Doesn't like to wear jackets, but he wore a jacket today just because I asked him to, so that was really cool. All right, well, we don't have a lot of people on here yet. We will. We'll get to our 20. We usually do, and then another 40 or 60 or 100 people will watch uh, whenever they want to. Um, so anyway, we've got Bible trivia today, and I've got my laptop open, so I didn't bring home any paperwork. Uh, typically, I do research online, and I print it off, um, and um, this is so much easier. This is so much easier. So you guys ready for Bible trivia? Here we are. we got eight people on here so far. Listen, here is the first question. Are you ready? To what city was Saul traveling when he encountered a great and blinding light? To what city was Saul traveling when he encountered a great blinding light? That is the first question that I want you to think about. Good morning, Dale. We are playing Bible trivia. Thank you for joining me. Saul uh, later had his name changed to Paul and became the Apostle Paul. And he was with his companions and he was traveling along the road. And we know that uh, he was traveling somewhere important when a bright light, uh, it, it just what's the word I'm thinking of, enveloped him, you know, and um, he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, he was traveling to the city of Damascus. Good job. He was traveling to the city of Damascus. And yes, you do not have to spell it correctly, so don't feel bad if you don't. My spelling is horrible. 
Um, so no worries there. Here is the second one. Good job, everybody. Who is the first person to come upon the injured man in the parable of the Good Samaritan? I'll read it again. Who is the first person to come upon the injured man in the parable of the Good Samaritan? Okay, think about that for a moment. Good morning, Matt. My brother is joining me from cold Michigan. Matt, it's cold here, but it's only 62. I think you're in the 20s today. Who was the first person to come upon the injured man in the parable of the Good Samaritan? Think about that for a moment. There were three different people uh, or three different persons that came to the Good Samaritan. Now, we know the third one was the Samaritan, don't we? But who was the first person to come upon the injured man in the parable of the Good Samaritan? Good morning, Mom. Good to see you. Some people are saying the priest. Some people are saying the priest. Yes, it was the priest. The priest was the first one to come. And um, he um, decided not to help the Good Samaritan according to Jesus' story, um, or the injured man. It was the Good Samaritan who helped the injured man. All right, I want you to finish this verse for me. There's a blank in it, okay? So I, I'm gonna give you a verse. I want you to fill in the blank. Are you ready? In every battle, you need faith as your blank to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. Good morning, Diana. Finish the verse or fill in the blank for me. In every battle, you will need faith as your blank to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. I love this particular verse. Good morning, Donna. Good to see you, my friend. Some of you are already answering. In every battle, you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. Do you know that there will be fiery arrows aimed at you today? Armor, okay. Yeah, I think it may depend on the translation, so I'll accept that. Shield is true. Shield is the answer that I have here on my computer. But are you, are you prepared, my friends, for the fiery arrows that are going to be aimed at you today by Satan? Because this isn't just a principle. This is a promise. You are under attack. And so you need your faith as a shield. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good job, everybody. All right, what tribe is Paul from? What tribe is the Apostle Paul from? There's 12 tribes, you know that. Which particular tribe is the Apostle Paul from? What tribe is the Apostle Paul originally from? <clears throat> and now some of these questions may seem redundant. I may have asked them before. Good morning, Pastor Mark and Esther. Thank you for joining us. Somebody says Benjamin. They think Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. <laughs> what tribe is Paul from? Yes, the answer is Benjamin. And I know there's a delay for some of you, so I have to say this every time because you're confused. Um, I'm asking questions, and because of the internet and the way it works, it could be my end or your end. There could be a delay, and I don't get your answers in time. Just be patient. According to the Beatitudes, who will be filled? Think about it for a moment. According to the Beatitudes, who will be filled? 
It's a tough one. I told you I'll mix in some easy ones with some hard ones. According to the Beatitudes, we know that that's written in the book of Matthew. I believe it's chapter 5, but don't quote me on that. According to the Beatitudes, who will be filled? Pam says, those who are hungry. Okay, that's a good answer. According to the Beatitudes, who will be filled? Well, Pam, you're half right. Esther says, poor in spirit. Pam is actually half right. According to the Beatitudes, who will be filled? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. That is every one of us. We want to be filled. But in order to be filled, we have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That means today we say no to the things of this world, the temptation and the sin that is all around us. All right. According to the Beatitudes, who will be filled? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. All right. Here's a tough one. Maybe it's tough. I don't know. You guys are so smart. Who is Stephen in Acts of the Apostles? Who is Stephen in the Acts of the Apostles? I'll accept a couple different answers. Um, but who is Stephen in the book of Acts of the Apostles? Now, the name of the book is actually Acts of the Apostles. So don't be confused by that. I could just as easily ask you the question, who is Stephen in the book of Acts? But the question is, who is Stephen in Acts of the Apostles? Who is he? Filled with the Holy Spirit? Some of you are still answering from the last question, and I understand that. Again, there's a delay. Uh, my mom is saying a martyr, the first martyr, who is Stephen in the Acts of the Apostles or the Book of Acts? Who is Stephen? There's several ways you can answer that. Shelley says, didn't he get stoned to death? Yes, he did. And yes, mom, he is the first martyr. He is also one of the seven that was chosen. Remember, it was the Apostle Peter who got with some of the other apostles, and he says it's not right for us to wait on tables. We need to be about the words, uh, um, the Lord's uh, 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 word and prayer. Let us appoint, I think, seven people. Yes, he was a deacon, so that's actually true as well. Good job, Esther. He was one of the first deacons, and he was killed for his faith. Yes, Pastor Pat, he was the first martyr, and all of your answers are correct. So that is fantastic. He would be considered, um, yeah, a deacon. All right, well, here's an easy one. According to Paul's formulation in 1 Corinthians, which is the greatest of the imperishable qualities? Don't get caught up in the wording here. According to Paul's formulation in 1 Corinthians, which is the greatest of the imperishable qualities? Feel free to take a guess. Think about 1 Corinthians. I'm not giving you a chapter. That would be too simple. According to Paul's formulation in 1 Corinthians, which is the greatest of the imperishable qualities? Some people are answering already. I see some of your answers there. Love or charity. Love. Okay, I see that. The answer is love. Yes. It is the greatest imperishable quality. I love it. Jesus is love. And if we have the love of Jesus in our heart, people know it, don't they? 
All right, here's a tough one for you. Let's get a little harder now. Who murders John the Baptist? Good job, everybody. I see your answers there. Who murders John the Baptist? Take a guess. It's a little harder than some of the other ones. <laughs> Going back to the qualities or the virtues of love uh, in Corinthians, we know that great love chapter is 1 Corinthians 13, isn't it? It's a beautiful chapter. In fact, uh, good morning, Stacy. Tomorrow I'm doing a, um, a funeral service. Uh, I've been asked by a funeral home to do it. I don't know the person, so don't, don't ask me who it is. Uh, you don't know them. Um, but I will be reading from 1 Corinthians 13. So who murders John the Baptist? That is the question. Who murders John the Baptist? There's actually a couple answers that I'll accept. Somebody said, Herod had him beheaded. Can you go a little further? If, in fact, Herod is correct, what is Herod's first name? Because remember, Herod is a title. So you are correct. Herod, because Salome asked for his head, Pastor Pat said yes. Good. Lynn and Terry say Herod. Good. All right, so I'm going to stretch you a little bit. Who murders John the Baptist? Give me the full name. Herod what? Herod blank. Can anybody give me that? Who murders John the Baptist? All of you are right. Somebody says Herod the Tetrarch. You guys are right with me on this. I didn't, I didn't think this one would be easy. Who murders John the Baptist? Yes, there it is. Antipas. Good job, guys. Herod Antipas. All right. All right, here's one. Uh, I don't think I've asked this one before in our Bible trivia. So you might like this one. Yes, Esther, that is true. Good job, everybody. When Christians observe Palm Sunday, which is coming up, what biblical narrative are they celebrating? When Christians observe Palm Sunday, what biblical narrative are they celebrating? So what, what happened that they're celebrating? We are going to observe Palm Sunday. We'll talk about it. What biblical narrative are we celebrating on Palm Sunday? Good morning, Goran. Good to see you. Hillary says Jesus. That is correct. Pam says Passover. Matt says he has risen. When Christians observe Palm Sunday, what biblical narrative are they celebrating? We will be celebrating. You ready? Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Remember, they used palm branches and they laid them down uh, while he was entering into Jerusalem. Yes, the king coming into town on a donkey. So Palm Sunday, the biblical narrative that we celebrate is Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Good job, Pastor Pat. I just saw your answer there. Again, there's a delay. So don't feel bad if you're answering a question from a little while ago. Um, it's not your fault. It's the internet. All right, so don't feel bad. Um, some of these are so easy, I'm not going to ask you. Here's one for you. I think I've asked this before, and if I have, I apologize. 
Um, better late than never. Good morning, Dari. Who takes Jesus's body off the cross? As far as we know, who takes Jesus's body off of the cross? So I'm mixing in some easy ones and some hard ones. This may be a hard one. But again, you guys don't lose a point for a wrong answer. Who takes Jesus' body off the cross? Think about that for a moment. And although I knew this answer, I still felt like I had to guess on it a little bit because I wasn't 100% sure. Who takes Jesus' body off the cross? Type it in. Esther says Joseph. Who takes Jesus' body off the cross? <clears throat> Can I get another answer? I know there's a little lag time. Hillary says an angel. Lynn says Peter. Pastor Pat says Joseph of Arimathea. So does Pam. Yes, the answer is Joseph of Arimathea. And I kind of knew that Joseph of Arimathea um, was the answer. And I know that he is a wealthy person. Uh, gave up his tomb for Jesus. I wasn't sure if it was him that took Jesus' body off the cross. I guess we'd have to look that up in Scripture, but clearly he's the one who asked for Jesus' body, so that, I guess that makes sense. Um, Joseph of Arimathea. Good job, everybody. All right, let's go to another section here. Some of these are... Too easy. I want to make sure they're not too easy. How did Paul escape from Damascus? How did Paul, the Apostle Paul, escape from Damascus? Think about that for a moment. How did the Apostle Paul escape from Damascus? Good morning, Stacy. Good to see you. Stacy Query is on here as well. Good to see you, my friend. Love that you're coming back to church with all your beautiful kids, getting to see you regularly. Hope you're doing well. How did the Apostle Paul escape from Damascus? It's a tough question, you can guess. You don't lose points for wrong answers. I know I've asked you this before, but it's been a while. It's easy to forget. The Apostle Paul escaped Damascus. Yes, he was held down by a basket. Yes. No, not an angel. That was basically how he escaped from Damascus. Uh, well, Peter escaped from jail that way. Um, the, the apostle Paul escaped from prison um, indirectly through an angel as well. No doubt about that. So he was lowered down by a basket from Damascus. All right. Who is the mother of Samuel? Who is the mother of Samuel? Remember Samuel in the Old Testament? Now, Samuel was a prophet, priest, and judge. He's the only person, according to my understanding, in the Old Testament that was all three. A prophet, a priest, and a judge. He did it all. Samuel was a very important man. He stayed faithful and true to the Lord all his life. Who was the mother of Samuel? Good morning, Michelle. Good to see you, my friend. And I love that your family is joining us on Sunday mornings. I understand you've got the baby on Sunday mornings. That is Bentley and Jonathan's baby. Sweet. Um, 
Maximus. All right, who is the mother of Samuel? Some of you have already answered. Some of you are saying Hannah. Is Hannah the mother of Samuel? The answer is Hannah. Hannah is the mother of Samuel. And God had a plan for Samuel from early on, didn't he? And God used him in a mighty way. Samuel anointed Saul king, not Saul Paul from the New Testament, of course. We're talking about Saul from the Old Testament. Good morning, Pastor Tom. And Samuel also anointed David as king. All right, here's an easy one for you, maybe. In what language was the Old Testament written? In what language was the Old Testament written? Think about that for a moment. What language was the Old Testament written in? Some say Greek, some say Hebrew. <laughs> what language was the Old Testament written in? It was actually written in Hebrew, and um, the New Testament was written in Greek. And Jesus spoke Arabic. All right, you guys are great. Old Testament Hebrew. So anyone who's been to seminary, um, Aramaic, yeah, Jesus spoke uh, Aramaic. I apologize. Um, so New Testament was written in Greek, okay? Naturally, a lot of Greek Christians would have helped write the New Testament. The Old Testament is Hebrew. It was written in Hebrew. So good job, everybody. How many sons did Jacob have? His name was later changed. But how many sons did Jacob have? <clears throat> you know, it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Yep, Moses wrote it, correct. Moses wrote a lot of the Old Testament. A lot of the Old Testament, not all of it. He wrote the Pentateuch, that much we know for sure, which is the first five books of the Bible. How many sons did Jacob, also known as Israel, have? How many sons did Jacob have? We don't know how many daughters he has. I don't think the Bible says. But Jacob had a certain number of sons. <clears throat> Some people are saying six, some people are saying seven, some people are saying three. Some people said, well, here's one daughter, okay. I'm gonna give you one more, maybe a couple more seconds here. How many sons did Jacob have? The answer is 12. 12, and they became the 12 tribes of Israel. Absolutely. All right. Well, here's one for you. Which tribe of Israel looked after the religious aspects of life? So I want you to go back to the Old Testament. <clears throat> go back to the Old Testament. Which tribe of Israel looked after the religious aspects of life? Think about that for a moment. God set apart one tribe, okay? Which tribe of Israel looked after the religious aspects of Israel? They were set apart. Some people are saying Levites. We know there's 12, <clears throat> it's one of the 12. <clears throat> I'm 
Many people are saying Levites. Good morning, Cheryl. Thank you for joining us. Which tribe of Israel looked after the religious aspects of life? The answer is Levi. The tribe of Levi. So for those of you that said Levites, same thing. Good job. Good job, everyone. All right. Um, some of these are really hard. Wow. Okay, here's one for you. And you may have to guess at this one. I don't know that I would have known this. I, I think I would have guessed something close to this. So here's a, here's a bit of a hard one. Good job, everybody. I see your answers there. Uh, one title of God is El Shaddai, which means what? One title of God is El Shaddai, which means what? Now, when I think of the song El Shaddai, I think it was Amy Grant who sang a beautiful rendition of El Shaddai. I don't know that she wrote it or even if it was her song to begin with. It may have been uh, hers to begin with, but we've... She's the one who made it very famous, no doubt about that. There's a beautiful song. It's called El Shaddai, <clears throat> but it's one title of God. And um, El Shaddai, which means what? Someone said shadow of the Almighty. Somebody said God Almighty. Yeah, I think Matt says Michael Card. That's good. I think he's saying El Shaddai as well. Yeah, that's good. One title of God is El Shaddai, which means what? What does El Shaddai mean? You guys are great. You're doing a wonderful job. <clears throat> uh, Jan says Almighty One. Derry says Creator. Okay. The title El Shaddai actually means Almighty God, okay, according to, um, according to this. All right. Here's another hard one, and then I'm going to do a e couple easy ones after this. So here's a hard one. What does Israel mean? Okay, no cheating. Don't Google it. I know you're tempted. This is a hard one. I just want you guys to think about this, and if you don't get it right, that's okay. I want you to learn something from it. What does Israel mean? Okay, these are God's people, and they were given the name Israel, right? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. We talked about that earlier. But what does Israel mean? What does that word mean? Feel free to guess. I would have to guess on this one too. Um, this is certainly one I did not know. And even if I had guessed, I don't know that I would have gotten it correct. Probably not. <clears throat> what does Israel mean? Chosen, says Cheryl. That's a good answer. That's probably something that I may have wanted to go with. It's not right, but it's a really good answer. What does Israel mean? I'll give you just another minute. Trumpet with God. That's a good answer. According to my records here, uh, wrestled with God. That's a great answer too, Pastor Pat. Uh, and they're not, they're kind of all correct. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not certain that even my answer key is 100% correct. I think we've found it to be false before, haven't we? Do you remember? Um, but it says, what does Israel mean? And, it, and the answer is, prevails with God. So maybe you want to Google that. Maybe you want to look at, um, look it up in the Hebrew um, you know, what does Israel mean? The answer is prevails with God. Now, I think this one's easier for you. <clears throat> I think this one's easier for you. So let's do an easy one. 
In which prophecy do we read about the valley of dry bones? In which prophecy do we read about the valley of dry bones? Remember the beautiful story of the valley of dry bones? You know, the tendons and the, uh, the muscles, it, they just kind of quicken and they, they kind of stand up and become a vast army. Do you remember that story? In which prophecy do we read about the valley of dry bones? A little bit easier this time, I think. There's the first answer, Pam, Esther. They think it's Ezekiel. In which prophecy do we read about the valley of dry bones? <clears throat> Some other people are saying Ezekiel. I see your answers there while I'm looking on to the next question. All right, the answer is Ezekiel. Good job, everybody. Ezekiel has the Valley of Dry Bones. What a great story, prophecy, right, that God revealed uh, to the prophet Ezekiel. And he recorded it very, very well. Did a wonderful job. All right. How are sins forgiven in the Old Testament? Another easy one, perhaps. How are sins forgiven in the Old Testament? Think about that. How are sins forgiven in the Old Testament? <clears throat> Matt says, sacrificing lambs. Pam says, by sacrifice. How are sins forgiven in the Old Testament? Lynn and Terry say, blood sacrifice. Esther says, through sacrifice. Hillary says, pray to God. You guys are so smart. All right, so, how are sins forgiven in the Old Testament? You're all correct. Animal sacrifice, okay? To be a little bit more uh, correct, it's an animal sacrifice, not just lambs. Um, they could sacrifice birds and pigeons, and there was even a grain sacrifice for those that were very poor. See, Matt, not everyone could afford a lamb. <clears throat> so if you couldn't afford a lamb, there were less ex uh, expensive um, offerings, sacrifice offerings that you could make um, so that you could be forgiven. Um, Pat Beavers, uh, sacrifices made by the priest on behalf of the people. Yes, animal sacrifices. Now, I gave this answer away at the beginning, but I'm still going to ask the question to see how many of you caught it. What is the name Commonly given to the first five books of the Bible. What is the name commonly given to the first five books of the Bible? That may be an easy one because I already talked about it earlier, didn't I? <clears throat> Esther says the Torah. What is the name commonly given to the first five books of the Bible, the Old Testament. Hillary says Torah, Pam says Pentateuch. What is the name commonly given to the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament? Yes, it's Pentateuch. You can say Torah, uh, but Pentateuch is typically referred to the Old Testament, first five books of the Bible. And yes, Moses wrote all of them. It's understood that Moses wrote all of them. Okay? <clears throat> 
Some of these are too simple for you. Here's one for you. What was the name of Abraham's nephew? What was the name of Abraham's nephew? What was the name of Abraham's nephew? Good morning, Barb. Good to see you. Barbara McCafferty. Pam says Lot. What was the name of Abraham's nephew? Abraham had a nephew and his name was Lot. Good job, everybody. What was the name of Joseph's youngest brother? Now, I want you to think about this. Okay, this is a bit of a hard one. Let's think about Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Okay, we talked about how many sons Jacob had. We already answered that question. So what was the name of Joseph's younger brother, the youngest one? We know that Joseph had several brothers. We talked about that. What was the youngest brother's name? I've got one answer so far from Pam Cardinal. Esther has chimed in. What was the name of Joseph's youngest brother? A lot of you are saying Benjamin. The answer is Benjamin, yes. Good job, everybody. You guys are so smart. All right, you guys are awesome. Here's one for you. Here's an easy one. I think it's easy, maybe, we'll see. On what mountain did Moses receive the law from God? On what mountain did Moses receive the law from God? Think about that for a moment. You guys are doing great. Barbara, you're doing great too. On what mountain did Moses receive the law from God? My mom's first. She signed in Sinai. And you get extra points for spelling it correctly because that's really hard. Good job, everybody. Yes, Mount Sinai. He received the law of God. On Mount Sinai. All right, wonderful. You guys are so smart. Some of these are really hard, actually. Do you guys remember somebody in the Old Testament by the name of Gideon? What weapons did Gideon use to defeat the Midianites? What weapons, more than one, so it's plural, what weapons did Gideon use to defeat the Midianites, according to the word of God. Not what you would think. What weapons did Gideon use to defeat the Midianites? I think Esther likes these Old Testament questions. She's good at them. She spent a lot of time in Jewish uh, teaching, Old Testament teaching. Pam says, a lamp, a horn, and a trumpet. Pretty close. And that could be correct, actually. It's not what I have, but there could be a different in translation here. The weapons that Gideon used to defeat the Midianites were trumpets, pitchers, and lamps. Yes, good job, everybody. Trumpets, 
pitchers, and lamps. Not at all what you would think. Which judge was betrayed to the Philistines by a woman? I taught on this recently in one of my devotions, I think. No, maybe it was a Wednesday night Bible study. Which judge was betrayed to the Philistines by a woman? Good job, everybody. I'm seeing your answers there. Remember, there's a lag, so don't, don't feel bad about that. But I'm just trying to move on. Which judge was betrayed to the Philistines by a woman? A couple more questions and then we're going to quit. <clears throat> Some of you are saying Samson. Which judge was betrayed to the Philistines by a woman? Somebody else is saying Samson. Hillary is saying Samson. Yes, you all know that. That's an easy one. I got to throw an easy one in every once in a while. Here's another easy one. I think. Who was Moses' successor after his death? So who took over after Moses died? I'll give you a hint. He was Moses' apprentice. Who was Moses' successor after his death? Who was Moses' successor after his death? You're all saying Joshua. Hillary says Aaron. Any other answers? Another Aaron, two Aaron's. Aaron was uh, Moses' helper, wasn't he? Uh, certainly that's true. However, the successor of Moses is Joshua. And he ended up <clears throat> routing a whole bunch of territory, including Jericho. All right? So here's my last question. Uh, which prophet secretly anointed David as king? David had to be anointed as king secretly. Now, he was a boy. He was young when he was anointed king, wasn't he? I think he had to wait 17 years until he actually began his kingship, if you will. Yeah, Aaron was his brother. That's true. But um, he was helpful. He was very helpful to Moses. He was also sometimes not so helpful. So which prophet secretly anointed David as king? Some, a couple people have said Samuel. And I did talk about this earlier. Which prophet secretly anointed David as king? And the answer is Samuel. And I know that's an easy one for you guys. But remember, he had to do it secretly. Why? Why did Samuel secretly anoint David as king because he was afraid that Saul was going to kill him. He was afraid if Saul found out that Samuel was going to anoint someone else as king, Samuel told the Lord, he'll kill me. And Samuel was a great man of God and the Lord allowed him to trick some people, and um, he did. He did. He got to spend some time with Jesse and uh, see Jesse's sons, of course. We remember the story. And they passed before Samuel, and Samuel was waiting to do what? Hear from the Lord which one he was supposed to anoint with oil to be king. And none of them, the Lord said, would be king. So Samuel says, what is this all? It, are these all your sons? And Jesse said, well, I have one who's in the field, but he's my youngest. And of course, Samuel said, we won't sit until he gets here. You know the story. So David arrives. Here's this ruddy, handsome, childlike boy 
I don't know how old he is exactly, but he's young. And he may be 12 or 13, I'm guessing. I don't know exactly. Maybe you can research that and let me know. But nevertheless, Samuel anointed him in front of his brothers, in front of his family, as king. And he didn't become king um, just because he was anointed. He had to wait. And when the time was right, God makes all things new. Amen? And maybe today that's how you feel. Maybe today you're waiting. Maybe today you feel like God has revealed something, some revelation to you, and you are in a time of waiting uh, for the Lord and waiting for your revelation to come true, to come to pass. Whatever that may be, my friends, I want to encourage you this morning as we close to be patient. That was my devotion yesterday. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, it's posted to my Facebook page. Yesterday, I, I taught on patience. And um, if God is calling you to do something, be patient. If God is asking you to move quickly, then you will move quickly. But most of the time, when you feel an urgency or it has to be done impulsively, it's not typically of God. I want to remind you, God often gives us revelation in which we are asked to be patient and then he will bring those things to pass when we're ready and when he's ready. Don't try to get ahead of God. If David had anointed, been anointed and went to receive his kingship before it was time or bragged about it, what do you think would have happened? He would have gotten in the way of God's plan. Now, I don't know why God had Samuel anoint David so early. And I don't know why God has us wait when we can be impulsive. But you know what? Like this COVID-19 that we're going through, <coughs> like the quarantine that many people are feeling, restaurants closing, schools shut down, why we're waiting so long for God to stomp out this terrible virus, nevertheless, we will be patient and wait upon the Lord. And what does the Bible say? Those that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. Let me pray for you today, my friends. Father, I thank you for my friends. I thank you for Bible trivia for reminding us of the New and Old Testament, the wonderful things that you've done with your people over the last 6,000 plus years. That which you've done with them, you also want to do with us. I pray, God, that you would fill us, that you would call us, that you would use us to do mighty things, just like people in the Bible. You have a plan and a purpose for everyone who is listening to me today. Help us to be patient, to wait for your plan to unfold. Let us not run ahead of you, Jesus. We lift up those who need a special touch from you today. We pray for those who are grieving those who are hurting, those that need to be comforted, those that are afflicted for healing upon their bodies, upon their spirits, and upon their soul. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you guys. Have a wonderful day. Today's Friday, so uh, make it wonderful. And I just wanna remind you that I understand Saturday Night Live is coming back. I don't know what day, so I, I'm not gonna tell you it's tomorrow. Pastor Jonathan, who's our youth pastor, is bringing back Saturday Night Live, which is our Saturday night devotion, and I think it's at 6 p.m. When? I'm not sure. I don't think it's tomorrow, but it is coming. Have a wonderful day, my friends. I see all those thumbs going up, the hearts. I love you guys. Be blessed. Have a great day in the Lord today.